you're turning to, to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> We're going to focus this morning on verses 9 through 12, but I am going to read uh, beginning in verse 1 so we keep our context, but just as we're reading this, so I don't interrupt it, just want to define a couple things. First, justification. Um, it's the, the root word is the same word as for righteousness. So it's your righteousification. You're declared righteous in God's judgment in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ credited to us and received by grace alone through faith alone. So that's what justification is. You're receiving this righteousness from God. Um, it's a, a declaration of our righteousness. Um, Paul's point has been, and here we'll continue to, to drive home the point, that only through faith in Christ can any person be declared righteous. For as he says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> and are justified, declared righteous, as a gift through the redemption, that's the purchasing of us from sin, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And Paul wants everyone to understand that no one can be declared righteous, justified by God, by any other works. Um, nothing we can do to earn our own justification. So without justification, we cannot be saved from the wrath of God with which we all um, deserve and are under his wrath and curse apart from Christ. And so the common grace of God, whereby he provides for the physical needs of the entire world, is a display of God's patience meant to lead us to repentance. So Romans 4, beginning in verse 1. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is, it is, it is right. It is good. It is accurate. It is without error. So we thank you that when we hear and read with faith, by your spirit, these words on the page, we truly are hearing your words speak to our souls. So we pray that you would now bless the reading and the hearing and the preaching of your word by your spirit and by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The word of the Lord. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. <clears throat> now to those, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. In this blessing then, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. The word of the Lord. So the first point <coughs> Paul's making here, beginning in verse 9, is, okay, uh, we just read from Psalm 32, actually, in verses 7 and 8, blessed is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And he says, so is this blessing that David is pronouncing, is that only for the circumcised? In other words, is this just for the Jews? Is it just, just for God's chosen people? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? And so the question is going to be, are we also called God's chosen people? And the answer to that is yes and amen. But when David is pronouncing the blessing on those whose lawless deeds are forgiven... The common 
uh, Israelite, the common Jew that was a believer back then would read this. And maybe even when David himself is um, writing these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his understanding is for me personally. It's just a blessing for the man to be. But he's also saying this is, a, this is going forth as the king, going forth as a psalm. It's like, not just am I blessed. Blessed is everyone. It blessed is the person. Blessed is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Now he's the king of Israel. And he, you know, foreshadowing a, a type of Jesus Christ to come. And so the question for Paul to, to give to the Jewish believers or the ones he's talking to, because there's this you know, tension between, all right, so we understand Gentiles are, are coming into the faith. Do they need to be, circ do they be circumcised? Do they become Jewish? And what Paul is saying is like, no, we're all going to point back to Abraham. Jews and the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, in Greek, it's the word ethnos. It's the, it's the nations. Uh, in Hebrew, it's a goi and goim. It just means the nations. So I actually, I, I'm sure I've looked it up before, but yesterday I was like, hey, where do we get that word Gentiles from? So, you know, you look up etymology of Gentile, and it takes you to etymology online. I know you guys all know about this website. So anyway, it tells you where, where do you get these words from? And the word, it comes from Latin. Any word in the Bible that you typically go and say, well, hey, what, that's a weird word. Where do we get that from? It's going to be Latin because a lot of our Bibles get translated from Latin was one of the first languages that the, the Bible is translated into apart from its uh, the Greek and Hebrew. And then so Latin was the language of scholars. And so that was the, the, uh, the Latin Vulgate and translations like this they had. And so when they are translating these things into English, some of these words like saints, that's another one. Uh, but Gentiles comes from that Latin language. That's for free. That's not even something you need to know for the sermon. But it means, but what I do want you to understand is when we hear this word Gentiles, it's not always translated as Gentiles in the Bible. Sometimes when you read it, you'll read the word nations. But you need to understand that that word nations and that word Gentiles is the same word. So and it's, it's, it's something we miss when we, we are reading from a, a translation. But, you know, you, you, the people do know the original language. So you're able to pull these kind of things out in books and during preaching and things. But um, this is going to be important. So when you, when you hear nations, you think Gentiles. And what you're talking about is there's the Jewish nation and then there's everybody else. That the Jewish nation was set apart unto God, especially under the, the Mosaic times, under the times of Moses, so that all these holiness codes and all these things were set up. So there was a separation of the people of God from these nations. So they wouldn't be stained by these nations. They wouldn't start worshiping all these other guys. They wouldn't start practicing all these things because God knew the more you go into the world without my Holy Spirit, because this is where the transition is taking place, the church today being sent into the world with the Holy Spirit, as opposed to the nation of Israel, if it had been sent into the world, it was with just this external law and everything. And we see what happened eventually to Israel anyway. They just become like the nations and they fall, not following God. But they were supposed to be a light to the nations so that the nations would come and be drawn to Israel. And then these nations, these people, would become a part of Israel. And some people did. They didn't have great success, but a lot of it did occur so that when a person, when a man said, I want to follow Yahweh, I want to be a believer, I want to become a part of this great nation. OK, circumcision, you must be circumcised. And the only point with this is circumcision was never only just a physical descendancy. It was never just the descendants of Abraham are the only ones who get circumcised. It was also anybody from the outside who decided they wanted to become a member of this community. They, wanted, they too wanted to worship um, Yahweh. So that's a, it's, a, it's a point. And so what I'd like you to do is just sort of listen, but I do want you to, this will be helpful, keep your place here in Romans, um, turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3, it's just a few books past um, Romans. So all the letters of Paul are grouped together and um, they're in order of, of size, so of length. So Galatians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 16, but just kind of hold your um, place there. Because what I want to do is just keep both places open because I'm going to read a few verses from Genesis 
so that you can hear the promises that are being made so that we can make sense of, of Paul's point. So who's to receive the blessing? And he's making the point. It's also, is, is anybody who believes? Gentiles and Jews. This is who it is. But for the Jewish person, it's like, we're including the Gentiles now. We're including the nations. The, the Spirit is going out into the world. And now they're inheriting this blessing and because their sin is going to be forgiven. And you need to understand this. And you also need to understand just because you're circumcised doesn't mean your sins are forgiven. It's about faith. And this is a, a common error during our time to think that people in the Old Testament were saved by works. And people in the New Testament are saved by grace. But if, if you had to be saved by works in the Old Testament, then nobody could be saved. That was the point of the law anyway. Nobody could be saved by the law. We have, in Adam, we're already guilty of breaking the law. So it just couldn't happen. And so it's always only through faith. Old Testament, looking forward to Christ to come. Old Testament, I'm sorry, New Testament, we're looking back to what's already been accomplished in Christ, but it's the same faith in God and what he's doing. So if you didn't have faith in the Old Testament, it didn't matter whether you were Jewish, circumcised, didn't matter. If you didn't have faith, you were not saved. You didn't have your sins forgiven. You were not spiritual children of Abraham. And then Jesus makes this point with them several times. Same thing in New Testament. Without faith, in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a member of a church, you've been baptized, none of this matters. What matters is faith in Jesus Christ. That's what matters. Same thing. This is how God's been saving his people from the garden, since the garden, since the fall, through faith of what Jesus Christ is going to do. Naked in the garden, they covered themselves with fig leaves. God says, that's not going to do. I'll have to cover you. Slays an animal, blood is shed, covers them with the, the, the skin of an animal, clearly foreshadowing the work of Christ so that they must be covered with a covering that only God can provide. The day they, they did not die that day, a sacrifice, a substitute occurred, a death occurred by which they were covered in righteousness. Then they were able to give sacrifices, live out the rest of their lives in worship of God until one day he died. And as you do read in, um, in, in Genesis, and it, it, you read the, 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 um, the, the ge, 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 geologies, um, they all end with, and he died, 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 until you get to, who is it? Enoch didn't die, but he was taken up. <laughs> it's like, okay, there's a, something different can happen. And he died, and he died, and he died. But death has entered into the world. But there's life and hope and faith in the future working of Jesus Christ, foreshadowing in all these sacrifices and all the workings in the Old Testament. And so now you have Abraham that comes on the scene. Abraham's walking uh, along. God chooses him and his people. And he, and he chooses Abraham. And he says the, this blessing. The first promise is a blessing. That he will be a blessing to the nations. That through Abraham and his offspring. The nations will be blessed. So Genesis 18, 18. You don't have to look these up. You can. But this, I'm just going to read these. Says all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. In Abraham. 22, 18. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 26, 24. In your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then he has a promise of having many children, many offspring. Genesis 16, 10. I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. So there's this promise of great many children, descendants. Then he calls this covenant that he's making with Abraham. An everlasting covenant in 1717, Genesis 1717. I will establish my covenant. This is God speaking. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Now, one of the things you have to notice to your offspring after you, not not all the children of Abraham were children of Abraham. Not every single person after him was a believer. So this wasn't a promise that every single one of your children is going to be saved, is going to be a believer. It was the promise is to your children too, that if they have the faith of Abraham, if they have this same faith, they too have the same promise given to them. And they are to receive these covenant promises. So Galatians 3, 16 through 29, we read, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. 
It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Now, there are other places in promises where he says your offsprings will be blessed and your offsprings will be more than the numbers of the sands of the sea and things. But this particular point he's making is like, because there's a play on this word offspring, it's like seed. That can mean one or more than one, you know. So that's what he's doing here, because this promise to Abraham is what he's saying here. Um, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So this promise made to Abraham is pointing to Christ. And in verse 17, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, this is Moses, okay, this is the law that was given to Moses, does not annul, it does not cancel a covenant previously ratified by God. So the Abrahamic covenant, this covenant that we've read about with Abraham in Genesis, is not annulled because of what Moses has coming. And you keep up, keep up. This is, this is all become very, very, very clear and interesting in a second. Okay, so it sounds like, I don't care about covenants and laws. Oh, you better, because this is important. So Abraham, covenant made. Faith, righteousness by faith. Moses comes, and there's law, and there's separation, and there's holiness codes, and all these things. And what God is, what Paul is, God is saying through Paul here is saying, it didn't mean that Abrahamic covenant went away. Okay, so Israel as a nation under the Mosaic Covenant, individual Jewish believers under the Abrahamic Covenant. Okay, so it's a nuance, but it's, 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 it's true. So the nation can go astray, but, you know, I stand at the door and knock. You worship, I come in with you. It's the same thing with the church. The church might go crazy, but individual believers you're still a part of me. And so this is what's happening during the nation of Israel too. The nation may come under judgment, but if you're faithful, so Jeremiah, all the prophets, <laughs> that's what they're saying to the, it's like there is judgment a coming. Don't, you know, you, you get yourselves right. And so that's what we see in the book of Daniel and things too. So <clears throat> verse 17, the law which came 430 years after Abraham does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to you to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels as an intermediary. Now an intermediator implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would have indeed been by the law. So you right there, you can't become righteous by keeping the law. Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for it. And so it's not now that Faith, the, the object of our faith has now clearly appeared, is what he's saying. For in Jesus Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized, and he does, he's making, this is where you get a connection between Abraham and baptism and entrance into this covenant community and faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So if you're in Christ, and any believers here, you're in Christ, you've been baptized with water, name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ through faith, you're Abraham's offspring. This is the promise. I promised me children. Here we are. Look at that. Not just us. People all over the place. Also, Jewish people. It's not God didn't just abandon the Jews. There's lots of Messianic Jews, they're called. There's Christian Jews. Jews that said, I see clearly. You know, I, I follow Jesus Christ. But it's the Abrahamic promise being fulfilled. Okay? This is the Abrahamic promise being fulfilled. 
Why am I stressing the Abrahamic promise? And it's because it is much underemphasized in much of our church culture today. Because we don't want to see, we tend to take the Old Testament and almost, I mean, you can get, I don't think I have, I don't particularly care for the, the New Testament and Psalms books. And the only reason is, I mean, you get somebody to the Word of God, that's good, but it's like, you're acting like the Old Testament is not as important as the New Testament. It's, it's the Word of God. And, you know, so, I'm not slamming people that do that, whatever, I'm, I, I don't have a particular fight in that game. I just don't want somebody to think that all I need is New Testament and Psalms. It's like, you're not going to understand anything about Hebrews without the Old Testament, and much of the other is not going to make a lot of sense either. So it's, it's just the, the Word of God to the church is the Bible. And it's something that, that's very important for us to know. And so the main point is back in Romans 4, 3. So I hope you held your place. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. We read, For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Righteousness through faith with Abraham. And that's very important. Abraham was justified by faith. He was declared righteous by faith before he was circumcised. And I don't know how long you think, if you've even thought about it, how long from the time he was justified by faith until the time he was circumcised. Um, now that I'm asking the question, you might be thinking, you know, because my answer to that question when I was, when I was reading this, I was like, I'm sure at some point I had to think about that, but I don't know. But in my mind, I've always got it pretty close together. But the, the people who study this, it was at least 14 years. And the rabbis would teach it was 29 years. So somewhere in there, 14, 29 years later, it was, there was over a decade went by where Abraham had been declared righteous by his faith and he's living life and he's still never been circumcised. So his point is, Abraham was not declared righteous because of circumcision which was a, a thing that people were, were having an issue with, saying that you had to be Jewish, and to be Jewish, you had to be circumcised. But he's like, well, let's talk about righteousness through faith. That comes apart from circumcision, so that Abraham is a follower of both, those who are not circumcised and those who are circumcised, Jew and Gentile, so that righteousness is not through this work. And it's not, and never was, just through being a physical descendant of Abraham. You had to be a spiritual child of Abraham and the nations, the Gentiles were to be drawn to Israel, as I've said, and when they converted, then they had to become circumcised, but they had to have faith. Without their faith, it didn't matter. It's the same today. Justification, salvation from the wrath of God due to all of us for our sin is only through trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. That's it. His death in our place, his resurrection for our justification. And so the question is, do you now believe and trust in Christ for your salvation now and forevermore? Do you trust in Christ for life everlasting now? You have to ask yourself that. You preach the gospel to yourself all the time. You struggle with things. You go through things. You renew your repentance. You renew your faith. You, you fall. You get up. You do these things. But you have to ask yourself. So secondly... I think I had a second in here and didn't call it a second. So if you are one of these people that likes to take notes, you will get frustrated at me from time to time. So, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> I was going to read um, Galatians 5, 3 through 6. So if you lost Galatians, I'm going to get there real quick. Galatians 5, 3 through 6, also important. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You're severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So you may have been asking yourself, well, what about circumcision? Do, or should we still get circumcised? Should they still get circumcised? It's like, not for a religious purpose. No, because circumcision was a, the keeping of the law. And so what he's saying is, it's by faith 
that we are the circumcision through faith. And then Romans 4 should make more sense as we think about those verses 9 through 12. is a blessing then for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How was it counted? Was it before or after he was circumcised? And this is what, what he's getting at are all these things. But that main point, 4.3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so that is our key point that Abraham um, also in 4.12, that he walked by faith. So 11 says, 4.11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still circumcised. The purpose was making the father of all who believed without being circumcised. So if you're a true believer, you're not a Jewish, he's still your father by faith and the promises come to you as well. That, that will be imputed to you, credited to you as righteousness. And then verse 12 and to make him the father of circumcised, of the circumcised, the Jewish people, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And so back in Romans 2, 29, we read, a Jew is not one, it, well, go back to 28 even, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by a letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Same thing with us today. If you're a Christian, a believer, you, you, you have to be inwardly. In baptism, we might we'd say now, it's a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by a letter. Our praise is from God. But it clearly is showing here that there is physical circumcision is not enough. It is faith. The faith, that same faith that Abraham exhibited is the same faith that these people must have as well. Now, if you look at verse 12, they're not merely circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of faith. So the word walk there in, in Greek is a military, it's a well-known military term. It actually means march. It's a marching, and it's a marching in a, in a trail, in a line, in a line that's been like, a, if you, if you, if, particularly if you have dogs, and you notice it's like you have a path, in the backyard, it's like they would just walk that same. It's like, please walk, walk over here for a while. Walk over here. Nope, I'm going to take that same path, that same path. And then they've got a path worn and you can't get grass growing. It's like, OK, I guess this is our path now. And so they're saying Abraham walked, walked. He walked a path led by his faith, compelled by faith. He was not trying to earn righteousness through works. Everything he did, he did through faith in Christ, when, when he, through faith in what God was doing and telling him to do. And that's what we're supposed to be doing following in the footsteps of faith. Paul even says it. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what I, mean, I had a seminary professor say, you know, can you say that to people? <laughs> you know, he's like, follow me. Can you say it to your family? Follow me as I follow Christ. It's like, you know, that's kind of, and so what does that mean? Perfection? No, it means I'm walking in the footsteps of faith. I know who the righteous one is. I try to live by faith and not by sight. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that I'm forgiven. I know when I mess up and I plead his blood and I ask your forgiveness that, that I have forgiveness for my father and therefore I need to extend grace to you as well and he treats you as I have been treated in the father and that's walking in this faith. And that's what he's saying. The Jewish people who are doing that, that means you have the faith of Abraham because you're walking by faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And so his third point then is what about, and this is the last point, what about circumcision? So first, as we're told here, it's a sign and seal of the righteousness that Abraham had before he was circumcised. Before he was circumcised. A sign points to the reality of the thing it signifies. So you go, you see the Carowinds sign. <clears throat> if that's where you went, when you went to Carowinds, was to the sign, you're going to come back and go, well, I didn't see the big deal. That was awful. <clears throat> it's like, that was a sign pointing to, to, to the Carowinds. You, you go to Carowinds. It's like, so that's what he's saying about circumcision. It's not the thing itself. But it is pointing to the thing itself. And then the seal is something that authenticates something that's genuine. Or it says, you know, this is mine. And so God is giving Abraham this sign of circumcision to authenticate the promise to him as being genuine. God is saying, um, this, is a, this is a sign of the righteousness you have. And say, why that? And one thing is because it's a, it's a bloody sign. 
and it points to the blood that we sacrifice in Jesus Christ so that we receive his cleansing and we are not cut off. He is cut off for, for us and the blood that is shed um, is efficacious for our salvation. It, it, that's what we need is his blood. So that's why now we no longer have circumcision because there are no more bloody sacrifices that are necessary for faith in Christ is faith in his blood. So both circumcision and baptism are signs and seals of the same thing. Regardless of where. Now in a moment we're going to take a little diversion from those who disagree with infant baptism. But I'm going to try to demonstrate the fact that um, infant baptism is, makes the most sense. But I also understand I have brothers who disagree. And they're welcome to the table. They can even join the church. It's, it's a disagreement. Significant disagreement. But we're still brothers in Christ. We're still of one church. So, um, this is, and I'm not just bringing it up because every now and then I just like to have this debate. But here it is. It does come up in Scripture more frequently than you may think. And this is a place. Circumcision and baptism are signs and seals of the same thing. Righteousness by faith. I hope it's been made clear that that's what circumcision is. And it's very clear that's what water baptism is. A sign and seal of righteousness by faith. An everlasting covenant of Abraham is everlasting and it is in that it is being fulfilled in the new covenant. It has been annulled. It's just being fulfilled in the new covenant. And Jesus, the offspring, has come. So that now the promises of Abraham can now be even magnified to, to more and more people. It's not even just males. It's, just, it's all people. It is being fulfilled in the new covenant in Christ so that we have Abraham as our father in the sense that he is the first to have received this promise of our salvation by faith. And we inherit the blessing through the covenant made with him that we might be the children of God. So today, as in Abraham's day, those who have the faith of Abraham are his children. And it's a multitude of children that was promised to him and therefore are to receive the covenantal sign of righteousness by faith in Christ. Water baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The promised offspring or seed has come, it's Jesus Christ, and the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit has come. The promised blessing of the nations has come. And when a person, Jew, Gentile, whatever nation, whatever background, male, female, um, when they receive this blessing, when that person goes from darkness to light, when that person goes from death to life, when that person turns from unbelief to belief, when that person turns from self to Christ, from sin to life, from forgiveness, from unforgiveness to forgiveness in Christ, at that second they are born again. So that's when you're imputed righteousness by faith alone and regenerate new life, new creature in Christ, and then they are baptized as a sign and seal of the righteousness that they had before they're baptized. A baptism is not, I'm not not doing anything. Else it's like, why do it? And this is what Paul's making a big point of. But it doesn't give you righteousness. Okay, and so two points. If you're, two points, sounds like a basketball game. Extra point. It's the one thing Carolina was good at. South Carolina can pour the extra two points. But here's my two points. <laughs> that, see, that's where daggum ADD, somebody pray for it. Um, Sign and seal, they regenerate new life, and they are baptized with sign and seal of righteousness they already possess by faith. So, here they are. One, you can have a person who is a true believer. They're going to get baptized. They get hit by a car. They die before it happens. And they still have righteousness by faith, imputed to them by faith alone. By faith alone. Or, you have somebody that's not a believer, and they come up. They do whatever they're supposed to do anyway. They get baptized with water. Um, that's not going to save them. They've been baptized just physically, outwardly, as the Jews who receive circumcision only outwardly also receive. And so um, just the main point being, and I don't want to get too much into what all these things mean, but that water baptism is a sign and seal of righteousness by faith. So unless you have righteousness by faith, that sign and seal isn't doing anything to accept to say that... You, you have authenticated, you have received this sign seal that says that there are these promises for those who believe and you don't have faith and it just kind of, it stands to your condemnation. And so you have to be careful about taking these signs and seals um, intentionally without faith. So that would be something that you would not want to do. It's the same thing with, um, with, with um, the Lord's Supper. So we clearly see Abraham 
Faith first, circumcision second. Now, what about his children? His children will be circumcised on the eighth day. And it is a sign and seal of the righteousness of faith. Children don't have faith yet. They might not even go on to have faith. Why receive the sign? Because promises to them as well. They're being brought up in the covenant community. They are being brought up to believe and understand and confess and profess these things until such a time as maybe they demonstrate, profess lack of faith, they're cut off from the community. Same in the New Testament. There's just no substantial difference between the water baptism and the promises and how they're conveyed and what they convey and circumcision and how they're given and what they convey and how they do it. It's just it's the same thing. The difference is one is a bloody rite that's only given to the males and the other is a water baptism that represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, this fulfillment that's coming in, this expansion of these promises. So then we have to say, um, you know, the person that comes to Christ, that believes in faith, um, then they are to be blessed with the covenant sign of baptism of water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just like Abraham believed, it was counted to him as righteousness, and he received the sign later. So what are the children of baptized believers? Are they to be baptized too? Abraham's children received this sign of the covenant after his faith, but before his children had received it. And here is the analogy, and I'll stop here. And I thought about this the other day, and it's... Um, citizenship. When a, when a person comes from another country say, to this country and they decide, I want, to be a, I want to be a citizen of this country. So what they do is they, they go through, I guess it still works like this, you, 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 you study, you take an exam, and then here comes the day. You stand in front of a group of people, maybe family and friends. They're all here to see the big day when you're about to become officially a citizen of this great country. And you take a vow and you do it and you're presented with something and I guess you get like a card or Certificate, I don't know. And, uh, but it's a, it's a big ceremony. And it's, it's awesome. It's tears in your eye. And it should be. It's like, it's, what a great day. We're a great country. And it's like, so then that, that person may think, well, why deny this experience to my children? Should I tell my children, I'm a member of this great country, but you're going to live here with me. But one day you're going to have to decide whether you want to be a member of this country too. You're going to take the test. You're going to go forward. And then one day you too can become a member of this great country. But that's not what we would do with our children. What we would do is to say, is to teach their children because they have a greater blessing of being raised in this country as citizens the whole time, that they're being taught to appreciate it, to value it, to be a good citizen, to recognize the blessing of it, and to live accordingly. And so then it's a little bit of, the analogy breaks down a little bit because we're in this country, we're in this covenantal community by faith. Our children, though, are raised in the church. They're evangelized as we are, preaching the gospel to ourselves every day, learning to live by faith, learning to grow in grace, learning to, to know and to love Christ more and more every day, and to hopefully one day, decades later, they can say with all honesty, you know, there was never a day when I didn't know Jesus Christ. Not a day that I can remember when I did not know Jesus Christ. Faith is not a one-off thing. It's not making a decision. It's not walking an aisle. It's not saying the prayer. It's not taking the vows. And we can be victims of revivalism and emotionalism where we think that to be saved, we need a tearful repentance experience at, at the beginning of it all. Um, but life in Christ is a life of tearful repentances. It is a growing in grace. And as I started to do this, there's a song that came to my mind um, when we first started going to Presbyterian Church. Wes King, I guess this was late 80s, early 90s. Um, the early 90s, right? Wes King is a song called Fisher of Men. And, and this is how it goes. I will not sing it for you. Um, it's running and walking and fighting, and turning the other cheek. It's giving, receiving. It's hoping, being bold, and being meek. It's laying down your nets. It's laying down your life to take up the cross and follow the fisher of men. It's winning. It's losing and trying. It's considering the cost. Remembering, forgetting. It's counting your gain as but lost. 
as but loss. It's living and dying and rising. Reward and sacrifice. The righteousness of Christ come to the fisher of men. And so I think sometimes what we do, and whether or not you give this covenantal sign to your children, having children in our home, what we do with them is we're not trying to get them to come to a point where they will walk an aisle, um, tearfully come to acknowledgement of their sin so that they might cry out to God, Christ once and for all to save them. But they grow up doing that, knowing their need for Christ. We do that. If, if we think of our life in Christ as, as that one-off decision, that one-time thing we've done, then we have to be careful of that because then it's almost like um, I got my get-out-of-hell-free card, I stick it in my pocket, and I'm off to races. It's growing in grace. It is continuing to preach the gospel. It's continuing to take hold of Christ. And that's what we want our children to do. We want our children to grow in this. Now, one day, they might end up saying, hey, I'm not sure I believe this. And we're going to go like, okay, let's talk about that. Maybe one day in your life, you're going to wake up and go, I'm not sure I believe this. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Let's pray it through. Let's think about it. It's, it's the same. We just want to make sure what we're doing with our children is the same that we do with ourselves, is that we are feeding upon Christ. And when they get old enough to where they can understand these words, what am I talking about? And they're able to say, I, I believe I understand and believe these things. I mean, you do that at very young ages. Then they can come to the table and they can take and eat because they're feeding also upon the gospel of Christ. But they need to understand at some point what they're doing. We're all growing in our knowledge of what we're doing. And maybe hopefully the decades from now don't look back too much and go, oh my gosh, I understand anything. No, I understand something, but hopefully you understand more later. But this is what we do. We grow. We're going to sin against each other. We're going to be sinned against. And we grow in our grace as we strive to forgive and be forgiven and, and live together and love together and grow in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So when we come to the table, this is what we're acknowledging, that we need him. Without him, doesn't matter what else you do, without him, we're lost. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the acknowledgement in your word that we, as whether we're Jewish or non-Jewish, we're trusting in the promises that were given to Abraham. They're also given to us that for those who believe, and we know now to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. That sin will not be counted against us. That we indeed have been credited with the righteousness of Christ. And now as we come to your table in just a moment, Lord, help us to remember, you said do this as a covenant renewal. It's not just a one-time thing. It's, a, it's an ongoing, living, active, vital, living and growing in grace, in Christ, in the gospel. So we pray you'd help us to do this and that we do it well and be lights in the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.